Okay, hey everyone, it's uh, Your Average Guy here, and we are doing a, an interview for a film that I reviewed recently, The Bystanders by Gabriel Foster Pryor, the man who is on the other screen just there. Uh, before we get started, I just need to sh do a big shout out to Karen Woodham at Blazing Minds, because she gave me the opportunity to watch Gabriel's film and do the review. Uh, so Karen, thank you very much. If you're looking for entertainment information, news, and every now and again, really solid competitions, check out Blazing Minds website and all of their social medias. And uh, check out Average Guy Entertainments on pretty much all the social media platforms. Gabriel, hello. Hey, thanks for having me. No worries. Okay, so um, before we go into the questions, give me a quick sort of pricey of the film. What's the story of, of the bystanders? Right, so... Um... The bystanders are kind of like guardian angels. Um, they don't look like angels. They don't have <laughs> halos. They don't have wings. They have like blue trench coats. But everyone has one and they're meant to look after us. Uh, we don't see them. They're invisible, but they, they affect our lives in little ways. Uh, but the bystanders, they're recruited from the human world. So they have human fallibilities. So they, they're lazy sometimes. They're irritable sometimes. Sometimes they, they're drunk. Um very human and yeah <laughs> and it's uh, a buddy movie between two of these bystanders between um a, an enthusiastic newbie and a, a kind of world weary veteran bystander who uh who really hates uh the guy he has to look after because the guy he looks after just plays video games all day and he has to stand and watch him when he's very bored and he generally hates humans because we've become really boring because we're always on our phone and watching tv and on the <laughs> computer and we're not doing anything interesting anymore uh, it's intensely up to date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, what was the inspiration for the the film and for the story? Well, like one of the characters in the film, I was playing video games um, <laughs> with my brother, and um, I think we spent forty minutes just deciding on a a certain type of armor for an elf character in the you know uh, customization uh, <laughs> screen or whatever it was and um i just i think the, the concept of guardian angels was in my head i'd watched the uh, wings of desire the momentous film not long before um there's also an element of nominative determinism i think because my name's gabriel so i, <laughs> I feel like the, the, the idea of angels maybe have been put in my head when i was a kid a little bit more than it would the average person I so i don't that. know how this thought yeah yeah I, I don't know how the thought came into my head but it it did the idea that you know if we if me and my brother had guardian angels and they were sitting watching us play games uh they would be so bored of us and i kind of made myself chuckle with that thought and um then i brought it to my co-writer jack hughes and we kind of took it from there really yeah i think we've all sort of had the image of people watching our lives a la the truman show and gone be, they would just be bored stupid um okay bored, <laughs> bored and annoyed oh well, yeah okay now <laughs> when i wrote the review I imagined the story coming together over sort of late night takeaways and early morning leftovers. I've got to ask, how was I accurate with that at all? Oh um, yeah, very accurate. <laughs> uh, I mean, me and Jack both have other jobs. I'm a like a film editor, is what I do. Um, okay. And so we we were writing this over a period of long period of time, but it was it wasn't like a full time writing process. It was something we would meet up in the evenings after work, or we'd meet up at the weekends. Um, and it's nice because it's a film about friendship and we're friends and when you get into your 30s you, you tend to see your friends a little bit less so it was actually just like a nice yeah. a nice excuse to meet up uh, with an old friend but we had a really good time doing it but um, I mean the one the one actual like writing big writing session we did I booked us an Airbnb uh, for some reason in Stroud and we went there to do a kind of uh, a session of uh, a few days and um we were let in by the host's teenage daughter who asked us <laughs> if it was okay if her and her boyfriend came around the next night. Um, and we were too shy to say no. Um, <laughs> and they turned up with, uh, I think it was like seven or eight friends the next wow. night and had a full on house party. Uh, and me and Jack <laughs> uh, sat outside smoking rollies and waiting for it to end while they played the worst music I've ever heard in my life. So kind of like happy hardcore. And uh, and then I remember a teenage girl coming up to Jack and offering him some cat at one point, which is wow. quite funny. Uh, okay, and, and so that was uh, like kind of 
that was our writer's retreat. Uh, which <laughs> I, I remember like I messaged the, the lady on Airbnb afterwards and kind of without, I had to like tread the line between trying to like not be a, uh, not get her door in trouble, not be a grass, but also be <laughs> like, this didn't quite go as planned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can't imagine there's too many people. I know Stroud doesn't really, he doesn't really bring sort of, to mind the right place to go for inspiration it's, but you know if it worked for you guys then you know what the hell i can't remember why i think it was <laughs> it was somewhere outside of london a little bit of a getaway okay. feeling yeah. not too far that we wouldn't travel too much and cheap i think they were the main tick boxes i was going to ask you about the process you went through but you pretty much you pretty much said all that just there so that that's very cool now one of the things i absolutely adore about this film was the use of the animation when the bystanders use their powers. Um, how soon into the overall planning decision was that made? And what was the kind of sort of budgetary concessions that you had to make to that? I think pretty early on. So that's something that me and Jack also did together because we used to make films when we were teenagers. And, okay. and that would involve this same technique that we used, this kind of oh, rotoscoping right, okay. technique. Um, so it involves printing out the frames, like turning the video into individual frames of, of stills and then printing those frames and then painting on them, drawing on them, scanning them back in. Um, oh, wow. And it's something we used to do when we were younger. And I think it was like, as soon as we kind of thought about the idea of teleporting, I think the conversation was something along the lines of, you know, this is going to be a low budget film. So would should we even have teleporting in it? And then, well, we could do it like that thing we used to do uh, oh yeah, that would work. And I think I think so. As I think right from the beginning, it was um, it was kind of part of how we were going to do it. I mean, I, I again, Jack would come over. Uh, you know, this is now after we've shot the footage, and yeah. um, and it was just something we did, like hanging hang out, but also doing a bit of work on the side. But we'd um, we'd print the frames, and and obviously you can imagine there's 24 frames a second in a yeah in a film. So and there's a lot know, of animation you know, that you use as well. Yeah. So if you imagine a 10 second clip, that's 240 pieces of paper. Uh, so my flat was just inch every inch of my flat was just covered in these printouts. <laughs> um, so it does look quite crazy. I've got some cool videos actually. I might make a little making how we did it video and post on um, Instagram at some point. Oh, I um, definitely like to see that myself. Yeah, I think it's the bystanders film is our Instagram. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll post um I'll post a little thing about how we did it. But I mean, the thing about that as uh, as well is that you you have to use printers, which I don't know if you've ever you know had this, but like. I feel like they're the most frustrating piece of. Equipment. Oh yeah! Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, you know, <laughs> it, it can it can drop from the Wi-Fi or whatever it is you're connected to for absolutely no yeah, reason, even though it, it knows the computer's there. And it's got yeah. worse, hasn't it? They haven't oh, got God, better. They're they horrible. Worse. They're horrible. Yeah. Um, so I, there, there was a quite, I haven't a had one for years. Time. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was a lot of wasted time trying to get printers to work. That's like one of my main memories of doing the animation was like me just like literally like punching a printer trying to get it to work <laughs> and not understanding why it's not working <laughs> See, knowing knowing that that's how you did it now that that makes it even more impressive for me because that that's a lot of work that's that's really yeah. really impressive it's time consuming but you can you know i mean the you set up the printer and then it's just doing its thing and you're kind of doing something else on the side and you know a couple of couple of cans and <laughs> just chilling out and i have some music on so it was, it was, it was, it was a lot of time, but the time was not all just, you know, heavy workload kind of stuff. And then when we do the painting, it's kind of you get that. There's not much of of a of a process where you feel like it's like, pre, like pure fun, creative, you know. Yeah. Uh, but like when you're with your mate and just painting swirls, you do, you know, that's a that's a nice bit. <laughs> Actually, feeling your hand do the creative stuff. I mean, I, I write myself, and sometimes I do write with pen just because it feels it feels better. Um, yeah. Okay, so when you were writing the film and you were thinking about what you wanted to do and the sort of the budget that you had, what sort of things that you really wanted to do did you either have to sort of lessen or sort of take out completely? Um, so, yeah, I think... I think that basically if you do a like a um a masterclass on like low budget filmmaking or you read a book like how to do low budget filmmaking, I think they all kind of say the same thing, which is 
set your film in in one location, have a limited number of characters. And you've seen the film, obviously. We just yes. did completely the opposite. Uh, we've got a football <laughs> stadium, you know, a, a, a closed strip club, uh, um, a swimming pool, a skateboard factory. You know, we've got all these kind of crazy oh, locations. There's and, dozens um, of locations, yeah. Yeah, and there's like a big cast as well. So we were kind of breaking the rules slightly deliberately, like knowing the rules, but breaking them to kind of maybe stand out as well. Like, so it doesn't just feel like a standard kind of low budget thing. But it does make it really hard. I mean, they weren't wrong. Those books and those masterclasses are not wrong because things like, you know, unit moves are, are really hard on a low budget and, and you yeah. do, you know, it is sensible to limit them if you can. But we found a way uh, to do everything we wanted just by, um, it just takes more time. The lack of money just means you have to put in more time and more effort to get what you want and find. And there's quite a lot of shots I had, like shot ideas I had that were quite crazy kind of shot ideas and, on the whole, we managed to get like a version of most of the things I wanted to do. Okay, like, it was just a case that you know we had to like build like DIY rigs and you know, um, so you know we when when uh, when Pete's throwing the paper airplane, you can see that it's yeah. kind of like his point of view, but the 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 the, the paper airplanes at the bottom of the shot and the camera's following him. Um, yeah, you know, like we kind of got a we, we found a way to like strap the the camera to the cinematographer's arm so it would follow him and then he could chuck the paper and, and that was a really way good, he did it. yeah that is a really good shot as well it, it's really sort of yeah good. and it, and it looks it, quite it, clever i'm sure there's a way to do it which is not the way we did it because the way we <laughs> did it i'm sure is like but we found a way and i think uh, with the, the the floating bike as well uh the shot with the floating bike i remember like we needed a um we needed a Boris bike when we were shooting near Highgate and they just, you know, they only have those kind of fire bikes in London in the certain places in the centre. And when we got to do the shoot, I realised that, you know, we just didn't have access to one of those bikes. So, <laughs> and it's such a limited crew, like everyone's busy, everyone's doing a job. And, yeah. and weirdly, like the director is weirdly the, the person who's least needed on a film set <laughs> because everyone else has a job and you're just there to kind of, guide everyone you know so i said to myself like right you will get on with everything you're doing and i'll go and find us a bike and so i went down to camden got a boris bike um cycled if you know london cycling from camden to highgate via kentish town is up highgate hill which is one of the yeah. steepest uh, hills in london it's been um, a while since right. i've been there but I, yeah i remember it. it's it's not <laughs> yeah. easy that highgate hill is is as close to vertical as the roads can get mm. and um yeah so i cycled up that on this like higher bike and arrived back on set with like sweat patches and but yeah delivered the bike and then <laughs> yeah and then we like the, the 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 actual shot itself was like a case of like taking a broom like the handle of a broom broomstick and um painting it green attaching it to the end of the bike using some kind of lighting clamps and then having to like master the art of like pushing the bike using this broomstick in a way that made it feel like it was actually being ridden um and then what you need to do to make it you know, t to then get rid of me as and the and the green stick is to film a plate, so like an empty, yeah. a, a, a same version of the same shot, but with an empty, uh, an empty plate. Um, and, and most of the time, we did still shots for that because uh, that's the easiest way of doing it. You do, you know, I if, suppose you if, the, if the background's not moving, then a still yeah. shot's going to be easier because you can just put it in a lot more. Exactly, and that's the oldest trick in cinema history. That's um, you know. George Melliot, A Man on the Moon, that was done in 1895. So, you know, we, we knew we could pull that one off because it is, um, yeah, it is. I'm sorry, I'm just getting a bit of dust away. Um, yeah, that's but we, could, we knew we could pull that one off. But then with that shot, we actually managed to do a moving shot as well. Um, and there was just a, like a really basic piece of kit called a Genie, which is like a motorized slider, which you can rent quite cheaply. Um, and okay. it just, um, I think it's similar to the one that, um, that uh, Peter Jackson used for the because uh, he actually used uh, quite lo-fi stuff on some of the Lord of the Rings because he was coming yeah. from the world of like low-budget filmmaking. So some of the stuff he used on like the model shots and on on uh, for Lord of the Rings is that kind of same, just a kind of basic motorized slider. But it just does the exact same movement twice because it's because it's um, you know electronic motorized. Um, so Ooh. we got a we got a, we got a motorized plate and we got the motorized version with the bike. Me, it was actually me as well doing the bike. Me right you know, walking along holding okay. it with a broomstick. So, so again, like there's 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 high budget ways of doing all these things. And then there's yeah. the way we did it. But in the end you kind of get the same result, I guess. So basically sort of through all throughout the making of the film then it sounds like you've used quite a lot of 
sort of quite old fashioned techniques, really, with the drawing of the animation and the various other things with the uh, plate of the background and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I I guess so. Yeah, I did. Um, we you get taught a lot about when I went to film school in Edinburgh, and you get you do get okay. taught a lot about the kind of the history of like the original history of cinema and like the the old you know the the old techniques of like nineteen twenties films and stuff. And I, nice. something is there is something very um, exciting and charming about that. But it's also just a case of you know I think if you try and do a low budget version of a Marvel movie VFX shot. It's just going to look to me. It's not going to be. Um, it's not going to look good, you know. To try and do, to try and kind of do a, a low budget version of something that's 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 like epic, you know. Yeah. Whereas I mean, it's, it's, if it's, if we did our own like handmade version, it was it would it would feel like a choice. Yeah, exactly. Trying to recreate sort of the big budget stuff when you've got a low budget is 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 going to, always going to be difficult but deliberately setting out to do sort of a low budget sort of equivalent you, you you're gonna you're gonna it's going to look better and the scenes you yeah. talked about it do look great in the film the the paper airplane the bike it all looks absolutely brilliant um okay so I, I was Thank gonna you. I was gonna ask you about what you might do if you remade the film in the future, but I think I think from what you said, it doesn't sound like there's anything you would change anyway, because it's 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 all gone really well. So I'm gonna ask you this one then. About the casting of Sean Walsh, a man who is very notable for his stand-up comedy and his sort of uh, performances on various comedy stand-up shows. Um what drew you to casting him for the role of Sort of the acerbic and, as you said before, world weary Frank. <laughs> uh, I've known Sean for a long time. We've worked together before. Um, oh, okay, cool. I mean, I, I think he's a very good uh, physical. Well, he is a very good uh, physical performer. Not just in terms of like his screen acting, which he does. It's not just on 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 in the bystanders. He's been in other things as well. Yeah. Um, but also in when he, if you watch his stand up, he is very physical. And he does these kind of act outs that are, you know, reminiscent of a silent comedy performer in that kind of sense that they're, you know, that they're he's made he he gets laughs during his stand up routines that are through physical uh through physical performance, not just through his words, you know. Okay. Um so he's kind of I think very suited to to kind of comedic screen acting in that kind of sense. Um but we'd also done like um uh uh web series called The Drunk, which was directly um playing on this idea because he's a big Charlie Chaplin fan okay. and he had this idea, this this idea to make a a, a short film or a web series about um a, just a drunk guy, like a guy trying to get home from the pub, but in a kind of Charlie <laughs> Chaplin style. So I think that's on YouTube if you you know you can watch I'm, those. I'm YouTube. I'm going to search for that because I've not seen that. That sounds <laughs> brilliant. Yeah okay. uh, we, we were both very happy with that. So but yeah he's very um you know, he was he was very he you know supportive as as, as well. Like, um, it did help to bring on board some of the other kind of comedians that are in the film, and um, and also when because we know each other. When you know when there was like there was a day when like literally everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and it was only a couple of days before the end of the shoot. And I was Oof. thinking like maybe we should just maybe we should just throw in the towel and like oh. come back to this later. Yeah. And I rang him up. You know, and I said, like, look, I'm thinking about postponing the last couple of days because this is just getting it's getting silly. Like, we've got, had we had storms and we had a oh, bout of food poisoning, and we had we just had everything. <laughs> but um, when I, I thought his answer was going to be, oh, great, I can have two days off and have a lion tomorrow, but he was just like, absolutely no way, you've got this far, you're not giving up now, and yeah. made sure that I I got to the finish line. So, yeah, it was, two, uh, two days. You'd have been gutted if you'd taken the break. <laughs> yeah. Well, we 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 ended up we did end up having to take a a, a month a half a year break because of COVID after that because yeah. we did leave some stuff that we were going to just come back to a few weeks later and we didn't know that there was a few weeks later was going to be <laughs> a lot more uh, than a few weeks later. Just a little bit of a bit of a nightmare for everyone there. Now, yeah. him and him and Scott Haran Haran. I don't know how to say his last name. So Haran, I apologize. Yeah. Haran. To, to Scott there. So they seem to have a really good chemistry on screen. How quickly did that build up? 
yeah that was really that was I was really pleased by that because um I think knowing Sean it helped because when I cast Scott I wasn't you know I didn't cast him for this reason but one of the kind of bonuses of, of, of was I got a sense that that they would get on um but you never know and yeah I could see them like before while we were setting up takes they were like pushing each other and like you know doing the normal thing of reading lines and like oh what if we try this what if we try this but also like I could see them having a laugh and um I was like, okay, this is this is good. This is really good for me, um, and and they kind of rubbed off on each other's like uh, uh, Scott's very um, obedient, and he'll do anything I you know I tell him to do, <laughs> and, I kept, and I kept asking him to do the most like the most silly stuff like uh, because we needed to because it's in the film, like yeah. you know what I mean. But like you know, he's like, he's in front of a green screen screaming her hung upside down and doing <laughs> like 10 takes and it's just no problem no problem i think i finally like hit the hit the line with scott because there's a you know there's the um the guy on the bench uh yeah. played by Rodner, the punk so he's meant to be like clapping and clicking and everything in front of his face um <laughs> and i'm just calling from from because it was a uh there's no there was no sound in the take so i could just call directions directly to scott and i'm like yeah. i'll try try clapping try Try clicking, try dancing in front of his face, and I think <laughs> I think I got to the point where I was like, do an impression of a chicken. And then, <laughs> I, think that, I think that was the first time he turned around to me and went, "Gabs, no." And I was like, "Fine, right, right, we got it, we're good, we're good." Right. So, and then I mean, with Sean, because we knew each other, he he felt a little bit more comfortable, you know. If I said like, "Let's just go for one more take five times in a row," he would, you know, he'd yeah. feel more comfortable making a joke about it. But obviously, he's one of the top com- comedians in the country. So his, oh, absolutely, his, yeah. his little cutting jokes were always funny enough that it was, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, the, it, it would get the crew laughing and it would kind of be good for morale. And um, yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's fairly obvious just from watching it that they worked really well together. Um, so that was, it was just, it was just really good to see him. Now, obviously Sean, I've seen a lot in various things. Scott, I wasn't familiar with sort of looked into, obviously, sort of his back and back up and stuff what sort of brought him into the film so yeah he has uh he he was the lead in a bbc uh show uh wizards versus aliens which was yes, written that, by that was the one i found <laughs> yeah so uh, uh was written by russell t davis the um the writer of the you know new doctor who's um yeah. and then he's done you know done some other stuff as well um so, but he was just found like literally my casting director, Alex Podelsky. Uh, we just had a lot of tapes and um, and his tape just kind of jumped out really. And then uh, uh, he he had the, uh, you know, it, it's just funny with actors because it's a trick. The whole thing's a trick. And, and, and however much you work in the industry and you know it, it's it still amazes you. Because I was like, oh, he's in my head. He was like, he's, he's already quite like the character. Yeah. And then when you get to know Scott, he's not at all like the character. <laughs> that was all just him acting, and obviously he's an actor. He's good at that. But um, yeah, no, he's he also kind of uh, is, is the the Wizards versus Aliens. There's a lot of you know you need to do a lot of um, a lot of VFX work and a lot yeah. of, kind of frankly be putting quite a lot of ridiculous situations. You know, I can imagine as a you know doing Wizards versus Aliens, you would have to be you'd be told, like, right now there's a alien, you know, about to fall on your head and you have to the old, the old, out of the way. The old tennis ball on the stick thing. Yeah, he would have had to do a lot of <laughs> tennis balls on sticks. And I and he was just super, you know, super professional with all that kind of stuff. And I think being in a show like that, which is kind of relentless, like a BBC show, you know, you're doing lots of episodes, yeah. multiple, you know. So I think he's just really honed his kind of screen acting craft. Um, he is, he just, is very good. He's very good and he's a, an absolute top professional. Like he's comes, you know, super prepared. And, you know, if you want him to give him a note and you need to do something different, he'd all he'd always just like um yeah, he's he's he's, he's kind of screen acting uh, craft is I think is is really, really excellent. Fair enough. Now what with everything you said there about the way they've worked and Sean's jokes and stuff, do you have footage of outtakes at all? And if you do Roughly how much? <laughs> um, not as much as I want. I mean, the, the thing is, that's one of the things about low budget, actually. We didn't have a full-time um, behind-the-scenes person, which would have been... Which is a shame, because it really... Like, yeah. it, like you said, you get... It really genuinely was, actually. A, a, I mean, there's a lot of... There's stress and troubles and all this kind of stuff, but but um, a lot of the time it was really fun. So it's a shame we didn't have more, but 
Um, yeah, the, I mean the, the the kind of I don't know what would be in the <laughs> what would be in the behind the scenes. I mean, what's unusual about our set was like a lot of the people there didn't have that much experience because yeah. because it's a low budget film. We're like you know we have we have trainees and we have people stepping up from one role to another role. Um, we had this partnership with um, with this acting school, the real scene, and they. Uh, uh, Alex Fidelsky, our casting director, runs yeah. this acting school. So a lot of like supporting actors came from people that were in had done classes at this at this school, um, and then some of them were like, not only will, will we be in the film, but like we we really like the project. Can we stick around after we're done with the filming, and we'll be a runner or we'll be an art assistant? So there's people on set that were like runners and and and, and assistants that had never been on a set before, never helped. And um, I think some of the stories, some of the funniest stories, come with those people because I. Um, I don't want to, I'm not going to name any names, but I remember <laughs> at one point I'm, I'm sitting on a bench and, uh, uh, um, uh, one of the art assistants comes up to me and says, uh, excuse me, could you move your foul ass? And, <laughs> and I said to her, I said, you know, I'm the director, right? Like you wouldn't see, you wouldn't say that, you wouldn't say that to Martin Scorsese, would you? And her response to that was who's Martin Scorsese? <laughs> uh, oh. that's, that's when I realized oh, everyone was, no. bit, that's when I realized everyone was a bit green, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, oh, there, there was another. <laughs> there was another one with um, with the continuity photos. You know, on set, you know, you yeah. build a set, and then you you have to take photos of all the all the props and all the positioning of all the props. Just even if you're done with that with that shoot, in case you ever have to come back and do pickups. Um, so I asked this uh, art assistant, um, "Can we get these continuity photos?" And I thought I'd explained what they were, and it's like no problem, no problem. And then later that day. Uh, she comes up to me and says, "Yeah, I've got all the photos," and it was just a series of selfies with all the. <laughs> uh, but you know, no harm done at the end no. of the day. And it, but it, and it was just, it was. Just It'll all be yeah. superb experience for those guys as well. <laughs> now, you you mentioned Scorsese there. Um, now, a lot of directors oh, yeah. from sort of Hitchcock to Scorsese um, have themselves in little cameos in the movies. Now, I'll, I'll be honest. I was I didn't know what you looked like, so I didn't see you myself. Um, <laughs> uh, were you in the film, or did you ever consider adding like a walk on for yourself at any point? Uh, I don't have an actual part. I um, uh, I have actually. I did actually go like I did an acting course when I was younger, and I was in one like horror film. So I've actually been <laughs> in a film before as well. But um, I I'm in the film a lot of times. Walking in the, I'm sitting in the back of the cinema. I'm walking across frame where the body needs to walk across frame. So I think three or four times I'm a, you know, I'm a really really proper background background up. That's just because we yeah. had no one else. I, I, I there's a couple of reasons why why you don't put yourself on the front. I think you you kind of when you're on a low budget you are like your time is a constraint and it literally is just going to take longer. If you're in the scene then you have to watch back playback. You can't just oh, watch the monitor yeah. live. Um, I was also kind of saving it as a, like a, uh, an ace up my sleeve in case one of the actors didn't turn up one day, and I'll just ah. be like, right, I'll, I'll do that role, and that never happens. Um, so that was good. <laughs> but um, and the other thing is, um, Sean, you'll notice if you see him nowadays, has short hair, right? Yes, in this film. I have seen so, that. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd be paused to film because of the COVID pandemic, lockdowns, and everything. So in that time, he got a haircut. So he's there's a there's a, a wig was made. Uh, our makeup art, uh, uh, one of the makeup artists, um, Chelsea Murphy, did, she did an amazing job actually. Really, we were really, really impressed with her work, and she made this this perfect, perfect replica wig of his old hair. Yeah, so one you, of the scenes, you can't uh, tell you can't tell from watching it where there's a change. <laughs> I do, That's... I do like to make people guess, but there's it's one really scene impressive where... actually. Yeah, 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 that is really impressive. And there's one scene where where Sean's wearing a wig, but I don't, I don't, uh, no one's been able to guess which one yet. But, um, I, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even want to watch it again to see because that's <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah, so there is also one scene where we needed a shot with the back of Scott and Sean's heads, and they're looking. It was actually a green screen shot that we've added onto the background of another shot. There's a scene that they weren't in, but you okay. see the back of their heads. You see the back <laughs> of their heads. Should I tell you which one? I might as well tell you which one. It's the sure. cafe. When, in the cafe when they're like the comedy flyers and they're doing origami. Oh yeah, there's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a shot of uh, and it cuts to a shot of um, of, of 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 Scott and Sean, the back of their heads. So they weren't really there. That's done on green screen and then added afterwards because we needed to add a 
a kind of link to the next scene. And yeah. actually, Sean wasn't really there that day, but we realised we could still do it because we had, you the had the wig. So that's me with the wig. wig. <laughs> ah, so you are in the film. Quite, quite, quite an important part. Though. There's also, I won't tell you again, or maybe we'll not tell you which one, but there is also a scene in the film that Sean is in, but Sean is being played. Sean playing Frank is actually being played by Scott. So Scott is in the Sean wig playing Sean, playing Frank oh, uh, wow. in one of the scenes in this film. <laughs> and that that just that just goes on. I mean, the, the, the quote of mine that you used on some of the some of the images, mind bakingly odd. Um <laughs> anybody that watches this, anybody that watches this film, and you should watch it because it's really good. It, it is it is such a strange film, but it's brilliant. Now <laughs> I the love that quote, is, thank you. <laughs> the film itself does have a sort of reasonably definitive end. Um, but is have you considered a sequel or is it literally just sort of uh, an enclosed world? So I don't think we ever will make one, but obviously just actually mainly because I've been asked this question in Q&As at film festivals, we did the film festival run. Yeah. I did obviously start to think about it a little bit and... Um, <laughs> I've kind of got a rough like synopsis in my head, but basically it tricky because it involves giving away the kind of one of the endings of the film. Uh, no, this is a no spoiler, is it? Oh yeah, no, I don't, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to give people spoilers. You, I want them to watch so you, it. You can, you know, one of the characters gets kind of involved in the world of politics, right? At yes, like, yes. In a very not like the film doesn't. Not get the it. ending I thought that would not not the way I thought that was going to go, but I'll message you no. about what I thought was going to yeah. happen. So, so that well, the film doesn't get political because we were just kind of making a kind of silly comedy. We didn't want to go down that road. Yeah, but actually, I do quite like the idea of um of of the political kind of angle of this and how you could use this kind of comedic premise as a for for a, a little bit more political kind of film because the bystanders are meant to be people who are in charge of our lives and looking out for us and looking over us, and instead they're irresponsible they're squabbling amongst themselves and they're getting drunk and the idea of a bystander getting into politics yeah so i don't that reminds you of anyone but you know yeah uh, i'm just gonna leave that out there (laughs) Um, so if you had bystanders and then they were in the world of politics you would have the layers like a kind of a mill foy of of irresponsibility you know uh you know it would have irresponsible it would explain yeah. a lot about the world. <laughs> yeah, you could have irresponsible bystanders looking after irresponsible politicians who are looking after us. Um, so, and because one of the characters kind of dips his toe into the world of politics at the end yeah. of the film, uh, all I'm going to say is that character would then succeed in their what the thing that they were going for, oh, and God. then that would be the start. And then it, he could be a kind of uh, oh, uh, God. he could he could be a character. Not, <laughs> Not too dissimilar to a kind of uh, scrappy head one politician we had recently, yeah. if, that, if that was to go that way. The other thing is, like with that, is um, oh god, it's hard to say without spoilers. But the yeah, idea yeah. of a YouTube, the idea of a YouTuber um, being involved in politics was something that we wrote as a kind of silly idea. Um, it's not that far since, off in the way the world when, is. When we, yeah, from writing it to shooting it and releasing it, some people, some YouTubers have actually run for mayor of london and i think that kind of whole concept is a little bit more reasonable now than it was at the time so that's okay. what we would that's what we would do with it i think if we were given the chance so we've got only got only got a, only got sort of about four minutes left so i'll run i'll just run through the last two questions sort of pretty quickly now if you could pick one film from cinema and direct it yourself and direct it differently to how it was done what do you think you'd pick um so I saw like a news story recently that Red Dwarf was getting a reboot. Yeah. And I thought if the bystanders had been released a year ago oh. and and we we'd we'd gone on to, you know, this, like, I think your oddness would spread work superbly country, well that for that. I, I would love to I was, that's the kind of thing I'd love to have a crack at. Um because I think you'd have a lot of fun with the comedy, but also the sci fi set pieces. Absolutely. Um, so that's something I'd like to have fun with. Um, yeah, but I mean, generally, I mean, generally, I'm not like a huge 
fan of remakes. So I would have maybe The Godfather. You know, we'll uh, <laughs> let's re- let's remake The Godfather and set it all in a bright and chippy. I think that's what <laughs> and, uh, I'd watch. Re- I'd, I'd, I'd watch that. Cause I'm not a big fan of the original. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, that, yeah. that that that's a whole other conversation for another day. Okay, yeah. now this is final question, and probably the toughest one. This is going to be the toughest question you may ever be asked as a filmmaker. What is your favorite film? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, there's there's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is a film I loved when I was a teenager. Loved when my, I just never stopped loving that film. There's films that I loved when I was younger. There's films that I love now. I think but that's Sunshine one that's gone Mind. all the way through. Yeah, I love Charlie Kaufman. I love Michelle Gondry. That's obviously both of them. Um, and I think that film you what you can rewatch it so many times and you find new details in it. And it still it still gets me. The ending still gets me every time. Um, and I think that that film wouldn't work as any in other any other medium. Yeah, like I don't think Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind play would work or or, or no. book or you know um, it's just it's really utilizing all of the all of the tricks of filmmaking. Yeah, it's uh, su- it's such a specifically done movie. Yeah. It so, definitely wouldn't work on stage at all. I, no, I mean, I, I enjoy it. And also I find it very inspiring, I think, as a filmmaker watching that film. I think it's a good thing to kind of aim to, you know, but it's very different tonally to the bystanders. So I think something in terms of like the tone of the bystanders, the kind of thing that I like is that, but they're kind of obvious things that everyone likes is like, you know, Ghostbusters, um, Men in Black, Groundhog's Day. Yeah. You know, these are the kind of things that... um I was brought up in and, and love in the kind of kind of genre comedy world. Shaun of the Dead, obviously, um, and also me and Jack both love British TV comedy. You know, we're kind of British TV comedy nerds, so we kind of we wanted to kind of bring a bit of that into uh, into the world of indie film as well. And you've done that quite successfully with the Bystanders. Okay, we have got less than a minute now, so I think we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, so, Gabriel, thank you very much, a for getting the the film to to Karen and then through to me and uh, B thank you for coming on and and doing this no problem I feel like I could uh, chat for longer so absolutely yeah and if I if, I, if, <laughs> if, if, if I had the pro version of zoom we probably would be <laughs> let me know if you're uh, uh, down in London anytime we'll get a pint <laughs> absolutely thanks very much man all right cheers bye bye